I want you to imagine for a moment a situation where the government, the wealthy elite, and the media are all in cahoots to take away property rights of the middle class and to further impoverish the poor while lining their own pockets. Can you imagine such a scenario? I'm asking you to put on your thinking caps, to to use your vivid imaginations for a moment, and, and maybe to help us get there, I'm going to rewind us to the eighth century BC, because it may be hard for us to put ourselves in the shoes of the readers of the book of Micah. But I think if we imagine that scenario for just a moment, we might understand this book. Let's go back to the 700s. Open your Bibles to the book of Micah. And the author of this book is Micah of Morasheth. That's to be differentiated from the other Micah, the prophet Micaiah. Now, this is Micah from the town of Morasheth. And, and he has signed his book, uh, not only at the front by introducing his own name as the author, but if you skip forward to chapter 7, And verse 18, he closes out with the theme of the book, which is also his name. Micah's name means, who is like Yahweh. And notice what he says in chapter 7, verse 18, in the conclusion, who is a God like you? So it's just fascinating. it's, It's a signature at the end of the book, in keeping with his name, which is also the theme of the book of Micah. Uh, Micah served as a prophet during the era of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And so there's a chart up here on the screen so you know where Micah fits in to the whole rest of your Bible, right? You you can zoom in on that, right? Um, Under the big blocks of 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, right there under 1st and 2nd Kings, you have Joel, Micah, Isaiah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Jeremiah. That's when Micah is writing. He's a contemporary of Isaiah. And Micah chapter 1, verse 1 tells us, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, uh, which he saw the word of the Lord concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So Micah the prophet is going to be speaking to the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Uh, At this point, the kingdom is split. 10 tribes in the north, two in the south. Uh, Micah is a prophet to the whole nation during the era of these three kings. So that's the setting. The theme of the book is who is like Yahweh. Uh, We're dealing with the era of 735 to 700 BC. And remember, BC works backwards. We're counting down to zero, right? That's why the higher number comes first. 735 BC, working down to 700 BC. And predominantly what Micah has in view as the geopolitical situation is the rise of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians are, are, are bent on the destruction and ownership of Israel. And the reason the Assyrians did that is they demanded tribute from a bunch of other nations. How can we boost our economy? Let's just threaten them with our mighty war machine and say, hey, pay us or you'll be in trouble. And nations gave them tribute. And when Israel ceased to give them tribute, they said, okay, that's it, we're taking over. Like they did many nations before them. In 734 BC, Tiglath-Pileser III invaded the northern tribes of Israel, and then Shalmaneser V came and mopped up in 723 BC, counting down to 701 BC, so this is basically the entirety of Micah's career as a prophet, Sennacherib makes his march on Jerusalem, down in the southern kingdom, and he essentially wipes out all the towns of Judah, now we're down in the south, all the towns of Judah leading up to Jerusalem, surrounds Jerusalem, and if you remember the story, he stops at Nob, the little hill outside Jerusalem. He can look from his vantage point over the walls into the city itself, and he is halted. And do you remember why he was halted? In the morning when his soldiers woke up, they were all dead, 185,000 Assyrians, and the army marched backwards. Sennacherib went and went home and was killed by assassins in his own country. So God stopped the Assyrian invasion because it was not his plan for Assyria to completely decimate all of Israel at this point, just the northern 10 tribes. And Sennacherib also took Uh, captives from Judah that were in the surrounding villages, not quite in Jerusalem. So all of that is during Micah's time period. This is a dangerous time to be alive, a a tragic time to be alive, a nervous time to be alive in the land of Israel. 
Now there are three sections. This book breaks itself nicely into three sections with three headings. Uh, Three places in the book you get the command here. And you have in chapter one, hear, O peoples of all the earth. In chapter three, hear, O rulers over Israel. And then in chapter three, hear, O Israel, where literally says, hear, O my people. Uh, But just to sort of make the parallel, we'll say that, oh, my people is Israel. That's who he's talking about. So the the book nicely breaks out into these three sections. It's very clear, uh, section one, section two, section three. And the next slide demonstrates that all three of these sections have two components, judgment and hope. Each of these three sections neatly, symmetrically breaks down into God's coming judgment and hope. It fits the pattern of almost all of the prophets. Yeah, there's one exception to that in the Old Testament with no hope. Uh, but all of them otherwise have judgment and hope and the three sections of Micah break out the same way. There's judgment coming and there's hope. Let's jump into the first section. We're not gonna read the book of Micah up front, but we are going to look at every word in the seven chapters of Micah as we go through. Because uh, you need to see all that's here. All right, in section one, hear, O peoples, Uh, we have this invitation. Beginning in verse two, hear, O peoples, all of you, listen, O earth, and all it contains, and let Yahweh God be a witness against you, Yahweh from his holy temple. For behold, Yahweh is coming forth from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth, The mountains will melt under him. The valleys will be split like wax before fire, like water poured down a steep place. What do we learn in these first few verses? The message of Yahweh through Micah to all the people of the earth is that Yahweh is not a regional deity. He is the God who will hold every person on the earth from all times accountable to his ways. We also learn that when Yahweh comes in judgment, the world itself disassembles. Look down at verse five. All this is for the rebellion of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. This is significant. Jacob used here, uh, the, the, the man named Jacob then became the name of Israel, means all 12 tribes. So you can see here that Micah is preaching to the whole nation, all 12 tribes, and think about this. They are the covenant people, and they were, be the, they were to be the light of Yahweh to the ends of the earth. And if the light is darkness, what hope is there for the world? That's the problem here. So all the world needs to know that God's central hub for light to put his own covenant faithfulness on display is dim, woefully dim. And the whole world's in trouble as a result. Notice verse five, what is the rebellion of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? Samaria is the capital of the northern tribes of Israel. Um, What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Notice that rebellion and high place are in parallel. High place is not a compliment. High place means those lofty places where people built idol uh, worship places, uh, altars to foreign gods and to demons. You remember the refrain from the Old Testament, on every high hill and under every green tree, you built this and that to this God and that God. High places is not good. So what is the centrality of rebellion for the northern tribes? The capital of Israel. Omri built it. Not, not that Omri over there. But the bad king Omri from the Old Testament and Ahab, they built it in the ninth century. And it became the central hub for immorality and idolatry. It's like saying, um, DC says, uh, DC is a metonymy uh, for the United States, right? It, the, the capital stands for the whole. Samaria stands for the Northern Ten Tribes. Here, God says, what is the, the high place of Judah? Jerusalem. What is the central hub of immorality and idolatry, of covenant disloyalty? It's the capital city. The world's got problems because the covenant people are backwards. Judgment is coming. Second segment of, first, of the first section. I think I'm putting all these up there. Yep, judgment is coming to Samaria. What's the problem with Samaria? Uh, they've got idolatrous syncretism in their capital built and developed by Omri and Ahab, 880 BC. And Samaria is 40 miles north of Jerusalem. So uh, by syncretism, I mean they are willing to worship the Baals and the Ashtoreths 
and still say, yeah, we like Yahweh too. They're going to combine both of them together and say, yeah, it's okay. Uh, They've got a foot in the world and a foot in the Bible, as it were. Notice verse 6. Here's judgment coming to Samaria. I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the open country, planting places for a vineyard. I will pour her stones down into the valley. I will lay bare her foundations. All of her idols will be smashed. Her earnings will be burned with fire. All of her images I will make desolate, for she collected them from a harlot's earnings. You see the connection between immorality and idolatry. They have prostituted their loyalties, and they are actually involved in the fertility cults, which which called literal prostitution worship. All of this is intermingled in their religious life. To the earnings of the harlot, they will return. Look at verse 8. Because of this, the prophet says, I must lament and wail. I must go barefoot and naked. I must make a lament like the jackals and a mourning like the ostriches. If you've ever been in the wild and heard a jackal, it is creepy. This high-pitched wailing sound that just gets under your skin and makes your hair stand on edge. The prophet wants to scream like that. And it also says he he wants to walk around barefoot and naked. What is that about? Um, Read Isaiah 20, which actually discusses the fulfillment of this. Um, Both Isaiah and Micah, as prophets, were instructed to uh, convey this picture of walking around barefoot and naked because that is exactly what the Assyrians and the Babylonians would do with captives. They would strip them and shame them and remove their footwear and make them walk across the desert into their captivity. It was a way to humiliate their captives. So the prophets actually talked about this ahead of time and Isaiah even had to act it out. Verse 9, for her wound is incurable. This is of Samaria. And then notice this, it has come to Judah It has reached the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. This syncretistic, immoral idolatry is contagious. Okay, that leads to the third section here. Judgment is coming to Judah. To Judah. Look at verse 9. The wound is incurable. It has come to Judah, even to Jerusalem. And then what happens next is a, a series of place names that come forward. And each one of these place names, uh, actually, you, you can't find all of them on a map. They're not sure where all of these are located, but, but generally in a circular pattern. Um, but they're listed in a particular order to develop a theme. And each one of these place names is tied to the verb in the Hebrew that it's connected to. And there's a really remarkable wordplay, sometimes using the same letters, sometimes rhyming, sometimes keeping with the same idea. There's no way to really capture this in English, but it is fascinating to read it. It says, he says in verse 10, tell it not in gath. And there's a, a G sound in both the verb tell it and in the place name gath. Um, weep not at all. At Bethla Afra, roll yourself in the dust. Uh, Bethla Afra means house of dust. So, house of dirt, you are dirt. Go on your way, inhabitant of Shafir. That, that's a word for beauty, beautifulness, and you will go about in shameful nakedness. The beautiful town is going to be shamed. The inhabitants of Zanon, which sounds like the verb go out, the inhabitant of Zoan does not go out, does not escape. The lamentation of Beth Ezel, uh, he will take from you its support. Um, Hebrew scholars have no idea what that word means. But there must be a play on words in there somewhere because the rest of them have it. For the inhabitant of Marath, which is built on the word for bitter, they become weak waiting for good, something sweet. Because calamity has come down from Yahweh to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the chariot to the team of horses, O inhabitant of Lachish. Rechesh, Lachish sound very similar. Uh, Horses, horse town, something like that. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion. That is, Lahish, which was a a strategic town in every battle that sort of came through that area. It was the stopping fortress for invading armies, or it had to be overrun if you were going to get through and take over. Um, But it also became the gateway to idolatry into Judah, a conduit for immorality. Because in you were found the rebellious acts of Israel. Look at verse 14. Therefore, you will give parting gifts... On behalf of Moresheth Gath. That's Micah's hometown. 
and they get to exit stage left like a game show contestant who lost. You get parting gifts. And he says, moreover, verse 15, I will bring on you the one who takes possession. This is like a rhyme in Hebrew, Yarash and Marasha. Uh, the, the conqueror will take over Marasha. And then the glory of Israel, verse 15, will enter Adullam. Do you remember the cave of Adullam? That's where David hid when he was with a ragtag band running away from his enemies. The whole of Jerusalem and Judah is going to be like a ragtag band running from enemies and the glory of Israel confined to a cave. It's really a, a stark, troubling prophecy. So he says, make yourself bald, cut off your hair because of the children of your delight. Extend your baldness like the eagle. They will go from you into exile. Jerusalem surrounding towns and populations were hauled off into Assyrian captivity. What is judgment coming for? Next section, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Judgment is coming for land grabbers. Land grabbers. These are those who take advantage of the political situation and they go about acquiring seizure of property by force. By the authority of the sword of the government, by the authority of the teaching arm of the land, These are rulers in government who happen to be in league with tycoons. These are land barons who have resources to buy up land when it's available and then force people to give them their land when it's not available. They're essentially erasing Israel's middle class by oppression and taking away property. They have power and they take what they want. Look what he says, verse 1. Woe to those who scheme iniquity who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it, for it is in the power of their hands. They do it because they can. They covet fields and seize them, houses and take them away. They rob a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. By the way, the inheritance in the land, the allotments of land were very, very important in Israel, particularly because they related to God's land promises according to clan. This wasn't just about property seizure. Um, This was a violation of God's intent for the land according to his promises to his people. This is oppression, greed, theft, government corruption, appropriation of private property. Verse three, therefore thus says Yahweh, behold, I am planning against this family a calamity from which you cannot remove your necks. And you will not walk haughtily, for it will be a bad time. On that day, they'll take up a taunt against you and utter a bitter lamentation and say, and that phrase literally in the Hebrew says, uh, they will uh, lament a lamentation, a lamentation. Three times the word lament is used in that sentence. We are completely destroyed. So the, the robber barons will be judged by God and in the same way they oppressed the people so the people couldn't get out from under their authority and couldn't do anything about their corruption. They just had to watch their land and their houses go away to some government official who's lining his pockets. And one day when they are judged, those officials will say, we're completely destroyed. He exchanges my portion and he removes it from me and he gives my portion to the apostate. Uh, What's he saying? The Assyrians are gonna come and take away the robber baron's stolen things. And they'll lament about it. And God says, you will have no one stretching a measuring line for you by lot. Notice this at the end of verse five. In the assembly of Yahweh. Really important language in there. There's a regathering coming in the future where God will actually apportion the land by lot according to his promise and the line for the allotment will not be drawn for them. In other words, they will be excluded, get ahead of myself a little bit, from the millennial kingdom. Judgment for them. When the covenant land promises are fulfilled, no part for you. Judgment is also coming, next section, for false prophets. This is in chapter two, verses six to 11. Verse six says, do not speak out so they speak out. These are false prophets telling Micah, stop preaching the truth. (laughs) And then these prophets don't speak 
concerning the warnings that God is giving through Micah. They're telling Micah, stop speaking negativity. It's unpatriotic. And then they won't tell the people about God's warnings. And since they won't do that, God says, reproaches will not be turned back. You know what the corollary to that is? If warnings were given and heeded, the reproaches wouldn't come. If people repented and obeyed, God's warnings would be withheld. But the reproaches will come because the false prophets refuse to speak the truth and they only speak niceties. They don't warn, therefore judgment is coming. Verse 7, it is being said, O house of Jacob, is the spirit of Yahweh impatient? Are these his doings? The false prophets are saying, wait, 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 I thought God was a God of love. Yahweh is so patient. Don't go around judging people. Of course, Micah is not saying, Micah is not judging people. He's saying God's going to judge people. And look at Yahweh's response in the second half of verse 7. Do not my words do good to the one who walks uprightly. What an encouragement that is. God promises judgment for disobedience. He says in verse uh, 7, my words do good to the ones who walk uprightly. In other words, covenant blessings flow to covenant loyalty, to faith. Verse 8, recently my people have have arisen as an enemy. This is Yahweh speaking to the, the robber barons again. You strip off the robe of the garment from unsuspecting passersby from those returned from war. In other words, the, the elite, the, the leadership, the rulers, the priestly class, they are treating the people of Israel like the wicked nations of the world, the Assyrians, etc., treat their enemies. Strip them naked as trophies of war. Verse 9, the women of my people you evict, each one from her pleasant house, from her children, you take my splendor forever. There God's talking about his own promises of the land inheritance. It's important to God. Verse 10 says, arise and go, get out of here, for this is no place of rest. What an amazing thing. The, the, the land of Israel was to be the land of their rest, rest from their enemies, Uh, significant rest from the curse, not totally in this lifetime, but uh, filled with God's covenant blessings while they were faithful. And now the land can't be a place of rest. You can't have rest in Yahweh without the righteousness Yahweh demands. Because of the uncleanness, verse 10, that brings on destruction, a painful destruction. Do you see the connection there? What brought about the Assyrian assault and then the Babylonian captivity? Israel's sin, their unrighteousness, their uncleanness. Verse 11, if a man walking after wind and falsehood had told lies and said, I'll speak to you concerning wine and liquor, he would be a spokesman to the person. In other words, any old preacher, any old prophet, any old priest who comes through and says, hey, everything's great. The land is flowing with wine and beer. Now, it could be that the the wine and beer here, or the wine and liquor, are are a reflection of uh, some of the promises God made about the fertility of the land, and and it will bring you blessings. Uh, The use of liquor here may indicate blessings to excess. In other words, not eating and drinking for the glory of God, but selfish indulgence and sin. Whatever the intent here, these prophets are saying, everything's going to be fine. And anybody who says, yeah, judgment's not coming, carry on as you are, life's great, gets to be a spokesman, gets to be the media, gets to have the badge and show up at the press conference and and send out the messaging. Next section is one of hope. By the way, the the sermons of verse 11 are, are sort of the easy listening preaching It's like the elevator music of sermons. It just doesn't indict. But you know it's insipid and it can't also bring hope. It actually has no good news. But we turn the corner in verse 12 and get to real good news from God. Uh, What is the real good news? Hope. And the hope here in verses 12 and 13, hope closes out each section of the judgment passages. 
The hope here is the hope in the tsunami shepherd king. He's coming. Notice verse 12. I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. That's important. All 12 tribes united together in safety and provision and shepherd it. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. What is the remnant? The, the faithful grouping of people loyal to Yahweh that remain. And I will put them together like sheep in the fold. Think Psalm 23 in terms of endearment from God to his people. He's providing for them. He's protecting them. He's giving them safety and provision. They are shepherded like a flock in the midst of its pasture, verse 12. And then he says, they will be noisy with men. That is, they will be bustling. It will be a humming remnant. Populous. Remnant sometimes sounds small, but this remnant, when Israel is regathered in its 12 tribes under the shepherd king, it will be a massive population. And look what brings them there, verse 13. The breaker. I don't know how you found it, Chris. The song we sang just before this actually has the word breaker in it. Was that on purpose? Okay. I, I didn't know the word breaker was in my Bible until I studied this. I didn't even know, re- recognize we had a song with the word in it. There it is. The breaker goes up before them, and they break out, pass through the gate, and go by it. So their king goes on before them, Yahweh at their head. What is this breaker? This breaker is a torrential wave of water that levels everything before it. It's a tsunami. And the tsunami here is none other than their king who leads Israel into their shepherd pasture, into their peace, and he wipes out all the enemies before them. And it is who? Yahweh. King Yahweh will unite Israel together with tender and endearing words of affection He will create a bustling population for himself and he will shepherd them and like a smashing tsunami wave will eliminate all their enemies before them. This is similar to 2 Samuel 5.20 where David says, the Lord has broken through. Same verb there. In fact, David named the place, the Lord breaks through. The tsunami shepherd king will win the peace. And that is the hope after judgment. Let's move to section 2. That first section was to all the peoples to the ends of the earth. This is who Yahweh is. Who's like him? The second section is to the rulers. Notice chapter 3. Hear, O rulers. Hear now heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. And listen to the indictment here. He's speaking to those who hold power in the land. Is it not for you to know justice? What is their job? To, to do what's right. As the heads of state, as the elite, as the priestly class, as, as those who hold leverage and, who, and those who have influence. Do justice. He says, you hate good and love evil. They've got it backwards. Power in the hands of the evil is awful. Look at the description. It's like cannibalistic. You tear off the skin from them, their flesh from their bones. You eat the flesh of my people. You strip off their skin from them, break their bones, chop them up in a pot as meat in a kettle. This is like the scene in Ezekiel 34, the the bad shepherds of Israel who are not feeding the sheep, they are eating the sheep. It's quite the reverse of what they're supposed to be doing as leaders in Israel. And look at verse 4. Then they, that is the bad shepherds, will cry out to Yahweh, and he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. Do you see the judgment of God here? He will make himself inaccessible to their pleas for help when they are in trouble. Judgment is coming. The next section deals with prophets who preach for pay. Look at verse 5. This is the media messaging. Thus says Yahweh concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. Uh, They are deceptive, and the deception has consequences. They speak untruths, and the people follow and 
and are out wandering around. And notice when they speak. When they have something to bite with their teeth, they cry peace. But against him who puts nothing in their mouths, they declare holy war. (laughs) Pay me, I'll say something good for you. Not going to pay me? Curses on you. That was their message. It's like they turned on TBN. Therefore, it will be night for you. Without vision, darkness for you, without divination, the sun will go down on the prophets and the day will become dark over them. In other words, God says, I will take away your platform, your microphone, your media deal. It's all going away. Divination is an interesting word. Um, Divination was the attempt to divine what's coming in the future. Uh, sometimes it could be said that uh, divination was a, a means that God employed with people, but more often divination was when you were trying to get around Yahweh to find out what was going to happen in the future, involving pagan and occultic practices, uh, interactions with demons and other things. God's going to take away their place. Verse 7, the seers will be ashamed, the diviners will be embarrassed. Indeed, they will cover their mouths because there is no answer from God. Verse 8, contrast, but on the other hand, I, Micah, am filled with power, with the spirit of Yahweh, with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious act, even to Israel his sin. So here's a true spokesman. He is alone, he is courageous, but he has power and truth. Uh, that's, That's the role of the prophet. That's what a prophet should be doing. Faithful preaching, exposing idolatries in the heart and sins in the life. The kind of preaching that says, wine, beer, whatever you want, everything's great, peace, safety. It's a false message. It's a false message for sinners wrapped up in their idolatries and immoralities. But Micah's hard preaching exposed the idolatries of the heart and put on display the sins that needed to be turned from. The next section, 3, 9 to 12, describes the powerful conspiring against the people. Verse 9, now hear this, heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and who twist everything that is straight, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with violent injustice. Her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe, her priests instruct for a price, her prophets divine for money, yet they lean on Yahweh saying, is not Yahweh in our midst? Calamity will not come upon us. What do they do here? Violent coercion, government corruption, bribes for everybody. This is the strong arm of government, the megaphone of media, and then the claim of innocence with bold-faced lies. Hey, we're good with God. And trying to keep Yahweh around is a good luck charm. Verse 12, therefore, judgment is coming. On account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field. You've been building it up on corruption. God's going to raise it to the ground. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. Bulldozed, deserted, overgrown. But there's hope. Look at chapter 4. The hope is in the shepherd king, and the world peace he will bring. Micah 4, 1 to 8. It will come about in the last days. Critical phrase. The mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of mountains. It will be raised above the hills. The peoples will stream into it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways. We may walk in his paths For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He'll judge between many peoples. He'll render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree, with no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of Yahweh of hosts has spoken." Can you imagine it? New topography. Mountains laid down. The Mount of Jerusalem raised up. New government. It will be perfect. The shepherd king will rule on the earth. No more corruption. There will be new religion. It will actually be the old religion and the only true one. 
In fact, there will be a worldwide hunger during this time, a hunger for the word of God. And the nations will stream to Jerusalem to hear from Yahweh. There will be true justice. He judges between many peoples and renders decisions for all the nations. And then there will be world peace. No more defense departments. No more defense spending. No more military industrial complex. Can you imagine all the engines of war and all the ingenuity of some of the engineers in this room? No longer employed to break things and kill people but employed for worldwide prosperity for the glory of God and the peace of the nations. What will that be like? And it all comes with God's guarantee. For the mouth of Yahweh of armies has spoken. Who will bring this about? Who will enforce that? The one who always keeps his word and the one who has all insurmountable military resources at his disposal. Nobody can stand in his way. God will bring it about. Look at verse 5. Though all the peoples walk, each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of Yahweh our God forever and ever. Listen, God has staked his own identity and integrity on fulfilling this promise, and the prophet responds with this doxological praise of my life is yours, O Yahweh. Why? This is countercultural courage fueled by eschatological confidence. I'm going to say that again. Countercultural courage. I'm going to swim upstream. I'm going the other way. I don't care what everybody else thinks. They can all walk in the names of their gods. I'm worshiping Yahweh. Why? Because he wins in the end. And listen, you need to know your eschatology. It's going to fuel courage to go against the grain now. That's the point of verse 5. In that day, declares Yahweh, I will assemble the lame, gather the outcasts, even those whom I've afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant and the outcasts a strong nation, and Yahweh will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. As for you, tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come, even the former dominion will come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Notice the terms of endearment here. When God uses the word Zion, he is talking about the city of Jerusalem, the capital, and he's doing so in affectionate terms. When he uses the word Zion in your Old Testament, he is attaching his commitment to restore and rejuvenate and refresh and protect and secure his promises for his people. This is a term of endearment and a token of promise. None of this hope is man-made. UN can't do that. The League of Nations can't do that. Greenpeace can't do that. There's no human institution, organization, or idea. John Lennon can't imagine it. And no movement on the earth could produce it. Only hope is Christ. Did I give it away that Jesus is the Messiah, tsunami, shepherd king? That was a little early, sorry. Jesus is the answer. Next section, chapter 4, verses 9 to 13, is the path to peace. It's pruning and preservation. Pruning and preservation. Now, why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among you? This is sarcasm from God. Um, You need this shepherd king. Go ahead. Produce him. It's not going to happen. Your counselors have gone away. Listen, this is bad news and good news for Israel. They're going to writhe, verse 10, and labor to give birth like a woman in childbirth. They're going to go out of the city, and they're actually going to dwell in the field and go to Babylon. Wait a second. What about the Davidic dynasty? Where's the shepherd king? We're, We're going to go to Babylon? Listen, this is 150 years before the Babylonian captivity. This is predictive prophecy. God not only says you're going to go to Babylon, but he says here you're going to be redeemed from Babylon. Micah here is predicting not only the Babylonian captivity, but the return 150 years before it happens and 130 years before Babylon was even a geopolitical force. This is remarkable predictive prophecy. It says something about your Bible. The Bible can do something no other book can do because this is God's word. God tells the future because he writes the future. Right here in Micah. 
Now many of nations have been assembled against you, verse 11, and they say, let her be polluted. Let's gloat over Zion. But they do not know, verse 12, the thoughts of Yahweh. They don't understand his purposes. He is gonna gather the nations like sheaves to the threshing floor, and guess who's doing the threshing? Israel, verse 13. Your horn I will make iron, your hooves I'll make bronze, that you may pulverize peoples, you may devote to Yahweh their unjust gain and the wealth of Yahweh Uh, their wealth to Yahweh, or um, excuse me, not Yahweh, their wealth to the Lord, Edonai is the word there, the master or Lord of all the earth. Who are the threshers? The remnant, the repentant, the faithful of Israel who believe in Yahweh, who wait on his purposes, who go through pruning and are preserved through trial and difficulty and captivity and everything else, all the times of the Gentiles. And in the end, are vindicated. How does Israel get to millennial kingdom peace? Um, Not automatically. Not just because they're of genetic descent, but by pruning, by preservation, and ultimately by gospel belief. Judgment first, then hope. Chapter five, verses one to nine, detail the shepherd king's comings. Two, two comings. Distress now, then hope, three times over and again in this section. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops, verse 1. They've laid siege against us. With a rod, they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. Perhaps a reference to Zedekiah when they're hauled off into Babylonian captivity. This is hopeless. Think about Israel going into Babylonian captivity. Jerusalem is decimated. They, They withstood the Assyrian assault but not the Babylonian assault. All the temple treasuries gone off to Babylon. The nation dispersed. The the royal family hauled off into exile and then Zedekiah embarrassed, his eyes plucked out while after his sons are murdered before him. Where's this Messiah shepherd king? Where's the Davidic dynasty? Um, This is hopeless. Notice verse two. This is like, but God, you know those great but God statements. Here's the, the darkest scene you can imagine, but God. We were dead in our transgressions and sins, but God made us alive. Right? This is one of those. There's no hope for the Davidic dynasty in verse one. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, that's the old name from Genesis thirty-five nineteen. too little to be among the clans of Judah. That is, um, when, when um, the towns in little old Judah were counted by their clans, Bethlehem wasn't even big enough to get a clan allotment by name in Joshua 15. Tiny, insignificant, it's a nothing. (laughs) From you, one will go forth for me, the the theological center of, of, of the solution here, to be ruler in Israel, again, Israel united. Not just Judah, not just the southern tribes. But one will go forth for God to be ruler in Jerusalem over Israel and his going forth are from long ago. How long ago? Uh, Back to Bethlehem, I mean, that's where David was born. Um, Back to the promises of Abraham? Well, no, from the days of Olam in Hebrew, the days of eternity. (laughs) That's really interesting. They will be given up until the time when she who is in labor is born a child and the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. Wow, reunion and return in verse three and he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of Yahweh. This is a a really interesting situation. In verse three, you have the woman in labor and bears a child. That's the king's first coming. But in the second half of verse three, the remainder of his brethren will return, that's the word for repentance, along with, literally, the sons of Israel. So this one born of the woman who's of the tribe of Judah will return along with his brethren, meaning the other tribes of Israel. Uh, They will return as in repentance and he will shepherd them as a flock in the strength of Yahweh in the majesty of the name of Yahweh his God. This is stunning. A promised reunion 
of Israel, and in verse three, a first advent, second advent split, right? We're between Jesus' first and second comings. It's not the only place in the prophets this is done. You can see this in Zechariah 12. You can see this in Isaiah 61, same thing. Those two advents stuck together in a verse, but obviously separated by time. At that time, he will be great, notice this, to the ends of the earth. This one will be peace. This one will be shalom. This kind of peace is the peace we've talked about. It's a peace through superior firepower. It's God's shalom through subjection of his enemies. He's going to have his way. He'll have his day. This is the tsunami shepherd king. Think about the worst enemies you have, the Assyrian who invades a land, um, or in verse 6, the the land of Nimrod who comes. Um, I don't think he's talking about literal geography here at this point. I think he's talking about, think of the worst enemies you can. And in that day, the geopolitical enemies were Assyria and Babylon. They're both named here, Assyria and Nimrod. It's like saying, think of your worst nightmares. They're nothings when this king reigns. Nazis and zombies Nothing. It's hard to pick bad guys that you you don't want to offend, right? Somebody is going to be from some country that I think is a bad guy. That's not going to go well as an illustration. But nobody likes Nazis, and everybody's prepping themselves for zombies, so that's safe. Verse 7, then the remnant of Jacob will be among many peoples. The remnant of Jacob, repentant, faithful, and the whole nation, 12 tribes. Here it is again. And they'll be among many peoples, like dew from the Lord, like showers on vegetation. In other words, Israel will be a refreshment to the world. (laughs) And then verse 8, the remnant of Jacob will be among many nations, among many peoples, like a lion among the domesticated beasts of the forest, like a young lion among flocks of sheep. If he passes through, he tramples down and tears and under rescue. In other words, Israel will be politically dominant during this time as well. Verse 9, your hand will be lifted up against your adversaries and all your enemies will be cut off. No more enemies. By the way, since Micah's day, when has any of this happened? (laughs) A united Israel, a repentant national Israel, the end of all of Israel's enemies? These are still promises unfulfilled. Next section, verse 10 to 15. What is the path to such peace? What is the path to such peace? It is the demolition of self-sufficiency. The demolition of self-sufficiency. Here, Micah picks up on this phrase, cut off from verse nine. Your enemies will be all cut off. But Israel, I've got work to do with you. It will be in that day, declares Yahweh, that I will cut off your horses from among you and I will destroy your chariots. The horses were those fast-moving things like modern-day airplanes. They let you do reconnaissance. They let you get from point A to point B really fast. The chariots were like tanks. Uh, letting you do heavy warfare with protection and a a place to shoot stuff from. Uh, All of that I'm going to take away from you. I'm going to tear down your cities. I'm going to cut off your cities and tear down your fortifications. Uh, What is God saying? Um, I'm I'm going to eliminate uh, all of your defenses. You you cannot defend uh, or depend on defense spending. You think about the technologies that modern day Israel has assembled for themselves to protect themselves in hostile territory. Iron Dome. You know, they're they're always being bombarded by rockets. I know what we'll do. We'll build a bunch of rockets that can intercept rockets and keep us all safe. What is Israel trusting in now? Defense spending and technology. God says, I'm gonna take it all away. I'm gonna take away your self-sufficiency. And then verse 12, I will cut off sorceries from your hand. That is the idea that you could control the future. That's sorcery. And I will take out your fortune tellers. That is the ability to predict the future. All of that is a matter of control. I want to know what's coming so I can prepare for it, or I want to control what's coming. And then I will cut off your carved images, verse 13, your sacred pillars, so that you will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. I will root out your asherim from among you. Uh, These sacred pillars and carved images and asherim, these these were the tokens of their idolatry, that if you worship these idols in just this way, you get what you want. Good crops, children, prosperity. God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove all of that from you. What is God saying? Yahweh is enough. I'm not going to let you trust in your smarts or your strength or your insight or your control. 
or your desires. This is loving destruction with transformational intent, to quote Dale Ralph Davis. And God's going to use evil men to do it. In verse 15, he'll punish the evil men. Last section, verse uh, chapter 6 and 7. Hear, O Israel. God takes his people to court. Verses 1 to 5. Hear now what Yahweh is saying. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, he says to Micah. Let, your hill, let the hills hear your voice. Then Micah, answering God's summons, says, Listen, mountains, to the indictment of Yahweh and your enduring foundations of the earth because Yahweh has a case against his people. Micah is now prosecutor in Yahweh's court against Israel. Listen to what Yahweh says to them. My people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. Indeed, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I ransomed you out of the house of slavery. I sent you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. All the way to the promised land, from Shittim to Gilgal, so that you might know the righteous acts of Yahweh. God is saying, I brought you out of Egypt. Was that boring? I conquered all your enemies. All the way into the promised land and gave you rest. Unimpressed? What's wrong with me? In verse 6, we have a response from a potential worshiper. So God brings this case against his people, and a worshiper says, what do you want from me? With what shall I come to Yahweh, verse 6, and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings? That would be a sacrifice. Let's up the stakes a little bit. Shall I come with yearling calves? That would be really expensive, a lot to give up. Uh, let's ramp it up some more. Does Yahweh take delight in thousands of rams? Not enough? Let me try some more. How about 10,000 torrents of oil? That's when a dry riverbed uh, is swollen and uh, really washed out by some torrential storm in the desert, some historic flood. How about 10,000 torrents full of expensive oil? Is that enough? How about this? What if I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts and the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Human sacrifice, would that be enough for you, God? Listen, that's not hypothetical in Micah's day. King Ahaz, 2 Kings 2, did it. What's God's answer? No. <laughs> Frenetic religious activity? Do you think that's going to satisfy me? God says, it's clear. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what Yahweh requires of you to do justice, mercy, to walk humbly with your God. This is like Luther's first of his 95 theses. You read the first one, what does Luther say? Um, the life of the Christian ought to be marked by repentance. In other words, repentance is not a, a one-time thing or religious frenzied thing you do from time to time. A whole life is a life of faith turned over to God. That's what God wants here. Love of God, love of fellow man. A reverent loyalty, producing faith, producing obedience. What would justice look like here? Stop using your power to confiscate other people's property. And what would kindness look like? Care for people under your care rather than eating them. Chapter 6 closes out with God's covenant faithfulness. I'll just refer back to Omri's work in Haggai this morning. All roads lead back to Torah. God made promises about judgment. Look, he's just going to keep his promises. He can't let your unjust scales go unnoticed. He's been patient, but he judges Chapter 7 gives Micah's discouragement. Maybe you felt like this. Woe is me. I'm like the fruit pickers looking for fruit and there's nothing left. Is there any godly person in the land? Verse 3, concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks also the judge for a bribe. And a great man speaks the desire of his soul, so they weave it together. He's saying the government and the rich and the religious elite and the media, they all weave it together. 
The best of them is like a briar, the most upright like a thorn hedge. That is, they're irritating, destructive, tearing at the flesh. And then it, the, the treachery in the land comes down to treachery in the most intimate of relationships. Don't trust a neighbor. Even the one who lies in your bosom, guard your lips from them. Sons and daughters and mothers and closest family relationships, treachery. And then the book closes with hope. This third section, like the first two sections, judgment, then hope. Here's the hope Micah expresses. But as for me, I will watch expectantly for Yahweh. He's waiting on God. I will wait on the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Don't rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, Yahweh is a light for me. I will bear Yahweh's indignation because, notice this, verse 9, I have sinned against him. See, the remnant is repentant. They understand their own iniquities before the Lord. Then my enemy will see, verse 10, shame will cover her, that's his, the enemy, who said to me, where's Yahweh your God? And then my eyes will look on her, my enemy. At that time, she will be trampled down in the mire of the streets. What do you do when the enemies of God taunt the believer? You turn to Psalm 73. Think about the end. I, I was jealous of the wicked. They get everything they want all the time and their life seems to go great. Then I considered the end of things. And God's going to take them to task. In fact, if you think long about the doctrine of hell, you will pray for your enemies. This is a life of waiting and hope. Vindication's coming. Even from sea to sea and mountain to mountain, the whole earth will become desolate because of the inhabitants of those enemies on account of the fruit of the deeds, their deeds. The final section of Micah is prayer and confidence in the shepherd king. In each of these sections, we come back to this shepherd theme, and we do so again in this third section. Shepherd your people with your scepter, the flock of your possession. These are endearing terms of God as a shepherd, his people as his sheep, ownership and care and protection and safety. As in the days when you came out from the land of Egypt, I will show you miracles, says Yahweh. Remember the miracles of the land of Egypt? Weren't they great? Not for the Egyptians. <laughs> wonders of judgment and deliverance simultaneously. That's coming again. Verse 17, the enemies will lick the dust like a serpent, like reptiles of the earth. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like Genesis 3.15? Remember the promise that God made to the snake? Dust of the earth crawling about. Um, remember Romans 16.20? The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Similar language, similar promise here. The enemies will come in dread, verse 17. This is not fear of the Lord from faith. This is abject terror. Oh no, we were wrong. We're in big trouble. And then the book closes with Micah's name and the theme of the book. Who is like you, O God? And notice how Micah describes God. Who pardons iniquity, passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession. Did you catch that? God doesn't forgive all sins, but he forgives the sins of the repentant, those who turn to him in faith. He does not retain anger forever. He delights in unchanging love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all their sins into the depth of the sea. You will give truth to Jacob, again, all 12 tribes united, Unchanging love to Abraham, like the promises he made long ago, he will keep, which you swore to our fathers from the days of old. How did the people in Micah's day respond to his message? We actually know. Um, like uh, Haggai, <laughs> there was a positive response there of repentance. There is also a positive response to Micah's message. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah is writing a hundred years later. Jeremiah is facing the Babylonian captivity of the southern nation of Israel, uh, of Judah. And the, the politicians in Jeremiah's day are saying, don't listen to Jeremiah. In fact, let's kill Jeremiah. Jeremiah, stop saying all that stuff about coming judgment. It's unpatriotic. And Jeremiah is like, I've heard this before. They were about to kill him. 
Verse 17, Jeremiah 26, some of the elders of the land rose up and spoke to all the assembly of the people saying, Micah of Moresheth, remember 100 years ago, remember that guy? He prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and he spoke to all the people of Judah saying, thus says Yahweh of hosts who said, Zion will be plowed as a field, Jerusalem will become like ruins and the mountain of the house of the high places like a forest. He's quoting Micah 3.12 right there. In verse 19, did Hezekiah put Micah to death? like you're trying to do with me? Did he not fear Yahweh and entreat the favor of Yahweh? And Yahweh changed his mind about the misfortune which he had pronounced against him. But we are committing a great evil against ourselves. Do you understand Jeremiah's appeal? 100 years ago, Micah preached coming judgment Hezekiah listened, and do you remember the scene where Hezekiah spread out uh, Rabshakeh's letter from Sennacherib uh, before the Lord, and he prayed, and he repented, and he asked the Lord for help, and the Lord turned away the Assyrian army. Hezekiah the king listened to the prophet Micah, and God relented on the judgment for a time. What are some lessons here? Uh, let me give you just a few. Um, Counterculture is okay. It's okay to be alone for the truth. This uh, Micah 4, 5 verse. Uh, the whole nations may go after their gods. We're going to worship Yahweh because we know how it ends. It's a good lesson. Future confidence fuels present courage. Uh, repentance, faith, sincere devotion to Yahweh, doing what's right before him, is way better to frenetic religious activity. <laughs> I don't know if you know this in your own life. Man, I really messed up. What do I need to do? Stuff, 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 stuff. Go to things, do stuff. Check off the boxes of religious activity. That's not actually what God's looking for. If you're taking people's stuff, stop taking their stuff. If you're acting unkindly, stop acting unkindly. And if you are proud before the Lord, get humble before him. Love God, love people. It's not hard. I mean, it's hard. Omri, you said it this morning. It's really hard. Obedience. It's hard, but the answer is simple. What, have you do, what do you do in the face of government corruption? When, when all the, the people who hold the keys of power are lined up against righteousness, trust him, wait. God will be just, he'll right every injustice. There's a message here about contentment. Look at, look at Micah chapter five. Verses 10 to 15, these things that God's going to do to cut off from Israel one day so that they don't rely on themselves anymore. This is all about contentment in the Lord. Is he enough? Again, the whole theme of the book, who is like Yahweh? Does he not provide? Does he not give you all that you need? Um, we are so tempted to rely on our own resources, a defense department, missiles, tanks, chariots, whatever. Uh, diviners, man, can somebody just tell me what's gonna happen so I can plan, uh, so I can make better financial investments? Can, can I get a predictor of the future? Or even a sorcerer, can I control my future? Can I manipulate things? Can, can I get out ahead of stuff and make it go the way I want? Or, or, or maybe the idolatries. Ah, I want children, I can't have them. Uh, I'm going to go around some bioethical things and see what comes about. Um, I, I want to be married, and God hasn't provided it yet, so I'm going to cut corners and marry an unbeliever. I mean, fill in the blank. We're, we're not so far removed from the fertility cults and the prosperity cults of the pagan nations surrounding Israel. They were tempted by those things. That's not some ancient people that did weird stuff back in the day. They're, they're like us. We do those things at the heart level. Trust the Lord. <laughs> Be careful who you listen to. Right? There, there, there are prophets, priests, uh, preachers, pastors, whatever, um, that will not indict your flesh, that will not convict your lusts, that will not expose your idolatries. Be careful who you listen to. Um, where is our hope? King Jesus. Uh, one takeaway, if, if you're in a position of power, don't use your power to take other people's stuff. That's a good application. Let me end with a quote from 
scholar Dale Ralph Davis. By the way, his commentary on Micah, among a few others, is just phenomenal and the one upon whom I relied most. Uh, He says this, Who knows what it may cost to walk through the unbelief and ridicule of one's own generation? It may cost you. But we must walk on in the name of Yahweh our God while we await the end of the days. That's right. And God's worth waiting for. Who is like Yahweh? Let's pray. Lord, implant this book deep in our hearts and let Micah and his message go with us into our places of work and school and life. We pray that you would do your work in us, that we might be faithful before you in a world that is crumbling under corruption. We pray to remain loyal, trusting in your promises, because you are faithful. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.